Um, welcome everybody else who is joining us today via Facebook Live. This is our second Tibet climate crisis talk. Um, and we are delighted to be able to do this to today, which is the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Um, there are events going on online, obviously, around the world. Um, and we're really, really pleased to see so many Tibet groups and Tibet supporters taking lots of different actions today. Um, I'm not going to moderate today. I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Lob Sang. Um, but before I do that, I just wanted to really quickly reiterate what I said last week about um, us broadcasting via Zoom. We do take the security issues very seriously and we don't have any internal um, conversations via the Zoom platform anymore. And we are very seriously looking at trying to move to another communication platform for public broadcast. Um, but this is proving to be slightly more difficult than we had hoped. Um, but by next week, um, we really should be on a different platform, hopefully blue jeans. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Lobsang, who's going to introduce our panel to you today. And um, I hope we have a really good discussion. Lobsang. Thank you, Mandy. Um, so, um, hi everyone, I'm Lobsang. And uh, so today's uh, topic of discussion is very important and uh, uh, in our first talk of Tibet climate crisis, uh, we discussed uh, the natural disasters in Tibet and the problems and the solutions. And today on the 50 years of Earth Day, we will be discussing human rights, uh, climate crisis, the role of indigenous communities and international climate negotiation. And uh, so when we talk about environment and human rights, they are uh, interdependent. And thus, states should ensure a very safe, clean, and healthy, sustainable environment in order to respect and protect and fulfill human rights. So with this, uh, today's discussion, we have a very two interesting speaker, uh, Kinzum uh, Dungu and Simon, Dr. Simon. And um, hi, everyone. Kinzum and Simon. Hi, Lopsang. Hi. Uh, uh, Kinzum uh, is the executive officer of Australia Tibet Council and the Australian representative in the Tibetan Parliament in exile. Uh, Kinzum was also the co author and alongside Simon and Gabriel of uh, Australia Tibet Council's uh, 2019 report called An Iron Fist in the Golden Glove. And Dr. Simon uh, is an expert on the global climate crisis and uh, has spent almost over a decade campaigning for climate justice in Tibet, Australia, and uh, the Pacific. He was also the author of uh, Australia Tibet Council's 2015 report, Environment and Tibet and Environmental Challenge. Uh, so with, in uh, our today's discussion, we have uh, basically two sessions. Uh, in the first session, I will be asking a few questions to our speakers. And uh, in the second session, then viewers can ask questions uh, and they can leave the questions in the comment box and then I will read out the questions to our speakers. Uh, so my first question is to uh, Dr. Simon. Um, so when we talk about uh, human rights and then we also talk about rights of indigenous people, and then we often discuss rights of indigenous people and respecting and protecting their rights to the lands and the territories that they have been owned uh, and occupied and also used. So can you please uh, tell us the role that indigenous um, peoples and the local communities play in uh, climate solutions? And uh, second, uh, what are the, some of the common challenges faced by the Tibetans and other frontline uh, communities around the world. Sure. Well, thank you, Dr. Lobsang. Thank you, Mandy, for, for this opportunity. And hi to everyone. Uh, before I jump straight into that question, um, I'm going to start with a little tradition we have in Australia, which feels 
very pertinent given today's discussion, which is to just acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we're speaking to you from. Australia, uh, like Tibet, is, uh, is stolen land uh, for which sovereignty was never ceded. So we always begin by um, acknowledging the traditional owners, which in our case, we're Kinzamanayan, is the, uh, the direct people of the Aora Nation, which is now this part of Australia, and paying our respects to uh, the local elders uh, past and present. And uh, just before I talk specifically about Tibet, maybe just speaking for one more moment as a Australian on this subject, as a lot of people would have seen, we had a, a truly horrific uh, bushfire season, which only ended a few months ago that saw enormous tracts of Australia go up in flames and more than a, a billion native animals perish. And one thing that really came to the fore through that experience, and of course has been known for a long time, is that Indigenous Australians, uh, Aboriginal Australians, um, had very important ways of managing fire and of uh, taking care of the Australian landscapes in ways that avoided these very dangerous fires and that preserved biodiversity and uh, that enabled them to live sustainably. And I think for us here, that's one very clear example of just how important uh, traditional knowledge and practices are in dealing with today's challenges. Here, it's particularly important around fire management. If we look at some of the world's great forest regions, uh, the Amazon, the tropical forests of Indonesia and Papua New Guinea, it's often said, and there's very good evidence for this, that the best way to keep forests standing, to protect biodiversity, to preserve the carbon stores, is to ensure that there is rights for local indigenous people, that they have control over their land and resources. And of course, it's precisely the same in Tibet, and in fact, perhaps clearer there than almost anywhere else, that um, if we want to protect the Tibetan plateau, uh, which as I'm sure we'll get to is such a crucially important part of the world for so many hundreds of millions of people, then one of the best ways to ensure that is to make sure that that traditional knowledge and wisdom that's built up over hundreds of generations is still able to be applied in decision making, in the traditional way in which, uh, in the ways in which uh, Tibet is, is used. And of course, that's important not only for uh, climate and environmental protection. You mentioned already that connection between human rights and, uh, and dealing with climate change. It's also, of course, the right thing to do. And it's what enables people to have you know, dignified lives and to practice their culture and to be able to uh, um, you know, live on their own terms. So we can see many examples around the world, and I think we'll talk in more detail in a later question about some of the particular distinctive aspects of um, traditional land management in Tibet and why they're, they're very uh, relevant today, but I think I'll leave it there for now. Oh, just on the common challenges, because I think we do need to identify these as well. Um, it's very true in Tibet as it is close to home here in Australia and the Pacific Islands and in a number of other places that people who've contributed the very least to the causes of climate change are really being hit first and hardest. And perhaps we'll talk a bit more later about some of the specific changes happening in Tibet. So that's a challenge in itself because people are dealing with very brutal uh, impacts of climate change. Um, despite that, despite all that knowledge they hold and not uh, don't necessarily find it easy to be included in decision-making either at the local level or an international forum. So that's certainly uh, a common challenge as well that we'll come back to. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Simon. And uh, uh, so you talked about the, uh, the cases of uh, app order digitals from Australia. And so my next question is to Kinzum. So when we compare that and when we look uh, to Tibet, so Tibetan nomads are the, also the frontline communities who has been protecting the Tibet's environment for a really long. But uh, right now, the China has introduced a massive plan of uh, almost like uh, 3 million Tibetans. You know, they have been removed from the grassland. So uh, what are the, the Chinese government's arguments to remove these uh, nomads from their grassland? And the second, uh, what are the new threats that Tibetan nomads face due to nomadic relocation? I realized I have not uh, unmuted myself. Um, so yes, first of all, um, I want to mention that 2020 this year is 
a critical year for uh, for for Tibet nomads and for Tibet's environment. You know, um, as you just mentioned, uh, you know the forced displacement of nomads by the Chinese government over the past two decades. Now this um, state engineered destruction of you know the Tibetan traditional way of life can can become you know can possibly become complete uh, when China uh, unveils this new system of national parks you know across across the Tibetan plateau which can cover uh, which can roughly cover 30% um, of the entire area of Tibet. Uh, now we all know, you know, everyone attending this webinar will know that how you know Tibet, Tibetan nomads have flourished on the grasslands for thousands of years, and you know, as you mentioned again, that you know, a significant population of the Tibetan people are have come from a nomadic background, so it's a big part of who we are as Tibetans. And now China is completely uh, transforming the Tibetan landscape completely transforming the social fabric of our society. And, um, and so what this means is that, you know, by ending this nomadic pastoralism in Tibet can mean the end of the Tibetan uh, collective food security. It can mean an end to a land ownership. It can, you know, of course, mean an end to the traditional Tibetan mode of production. So, you know, a once proud and resilient community has now been, you know, reduced to second class citizens in our own, in our own country. Uh, and, and ironically, China is doing that, uh, you know, in, in a year when they are hosting, I mean, of course, with the COVID-19, um, this conference has been postponed, but, you know, China is hosting the UN Biodiversity Conference in the, in the same year that China is launching this you know huge national park systems in system in in, in Tibet, so China is actually doing this you know all this um, you know in the name of conservation in the name of environmental protection in the name of development. Of course, we can talk more about how these arguments you know don't really stack um, uh, on each other, and so so of course there's nothing wrong with national parks per se. But we should also understand, you know, the darker side of China's national parks in Tibet, that it is a political exercise. And so, you know, when China unleashes or unveils this new system, we should make sure that, you know, the international community uh, doesn't, you know, jump and, and, and praise the Chinese government without really understanding the full picture. Um, so, I think you know we have a big job in ensuring that the Tibetan nomads get a fair deal uh, out of this new system. Uh, we have a big job to ensure that you know Tibetan nomads who are protecting their land and their environment. For instance, Anya Singta, as we all know, is going to face this trial in the next few days. Ensuring that you know these people, these voices are heard and they, they, their rights are protected. And I, I, I mean, as a Tibetan activist, I am worried that you know we this this thing is happening inside Tibet and it's kind of sleeping under our radar. Uh, thank you, Kinzum. And uh, I feel like you have raised a very important point over here where saying that, uh, you know, uh, in the name of conservation and in the name of protection of land, uh, the states, they introduced uh, so many policies and that can completely destroy, uh, you know, and uh, someone's, uh, the human food security and also takes control of that. that. Whereas when we connect that with the nomads uh, where, you know, from political point of view, what I feel is that uh, the nomads, they have owned this land for centuries and centuries. And then they use the policy of environment conservation and protection. They remove that. And so from the political perspective, once the nomads are removed, the state gets control of the land. And people are controlled by first the state gets control of the land and people are controlled by the states. So in this, uh, my second question is to Simon, um, why decolonization and self-determination is very important when we talk about 
climate change in in response to the climate change mm. thanks so um i think just to lead into this i'll, I'll share a, a positive reflection which is i think it's been a lot of progress made the last two or three years and international tibet networks had a big hand in this in bringing a lot of awareness to the importance of tibet itself to the um, global environment to the climate crisis i think you know, these days we see articles in the New York Times, National Geographic, talking about the roof of the world, the third pole, the headwater of Asia's rivers, um, all these things that make Tibet so important. I think um, the, uh, the next step um, that I think, you know, the movement's also getting better at, that we can keep getting better at, is then communicating why not just Tibet, but Tibetans and uh, human rights and self-determination for Tibetans is so important in driving the solutions. Why decolonization is part of the solution in Tibet and elsewhere, uh, which was what, what the question's about. Um, I think, I mean, as you've already communicated very clearly, and I think Kinzam and I both already touched on, um, uh, Tibetans hold a huge amount of, of knowledge on how to live sustainably on the roof of the world. Um, it's been built up over hundreds of, of generations. Um, and so, not just victims of the climate crisis, but very much, you know, holding the knowledge on how to uh, not, not only protect from further environmental degradation in Tibet, but also begin uh, recovering from some of the damage that's, um, that's been done. But of course, uh, when they're still dealing with the legacy of invasion and historical injustice and ongoing oppression and hyper surveillance and a very dangerous environment, are not able to do that. And, you know, it's a situation we've seen in a number of parts of the world, but it's probably perhaps more acute in Tibet than anywhere else. Um, so I think we're only able to uh, see those um, uh, solutions that maybe we can come back to a bit in, in the next question, you know, really come to life. And uh, Tibetans fulfill that potential again in uh, looking after the Tibetan plateau environment sustainably and with that have secure livelihoods and everything else if we see that process of uh, you know, decolonization, freedom for Tibet, essentially, that's gonna enable that, that's gonna be good for Tibetans, good for Tibet's environment, and because of Tibet's environmental importance, therefore good for the wider world. Oh, thank you, thank you, Simon. And for me, I mean, personally, I find this is very in interesting when we talk about climate change and then self-determination and uh, so what I feel is that whenever we look at the issue of Tibet and uh, so Tibet has been illegally occupied by the Chinese, it's a colonized country. And so with that, you know, as Kinzum earlier mentioned about the economic development, how in the name of economic development, uh, they have brought uh, economic development and then that has destroyed um, environment as well as they illegally occupy the whole land or hoping that you know there will be peace and stability in in the in the region uh, but then uh, when we uh, think about how can international community respond to the tibet uh, tibet's environment my uh, fourth question is to kinzum uh, when we look at the international community and uh, then with the tibet and then we have a china and then everyone talks about how China is powerful and how uh, China plays a role in terms of economic relations, trade with the, its neighboring countries. Uh, so why do you think that international community should challenge uh, the Chinese uh, you know, plans or the economic developments in, in Tibet? Yeah, sure. So first of all, you know, if these plans, um, the Chinese government's plans in Tibet remain uh, unchallenged, um, that's going to have serious implications, not just on the Tibetan people, but on the whole world. As you know, we all know the global, you know, how important Tibet is to the global environment. And, you know, we are already experiencing this with the coronavirus pandemic right now. You know, a problem in Tibet is not just a Tibetan problem, a problem in China is not just a Chinese problem. You know, it's going to affect, we live in an increasingly interdependent world. And um, so there are going to be serious ramifications for the, for the entire world. So that's one thing. 
Tibet, as we all know, is the source of all the major rivers in Asia, you know, upon which more than uh, 1.5 billion people, you know, depend on the rivers that come from Tibet. So, you know, for that reason, uh, it, it is important that international community uh, you know, challenges China on what it's doing on, on in Tibet. And also, you know, the, the arguments that are being put forward by the Chinese government, they don't stack up, you know, and the Chinese government are giving few, um, putting forward few arguments why they are displacing, why they are removing the nomads from the grasslands. And of course, you know, there are a few of them. Let's let's just kind of talk on, on three, three main um, key issues or three main key arguments that the Chinese government is presenting uh, in, on this issue. Number one is the degradation of the land, you know, how um, the overgrazing by the nomads is causing um, the degradation of the Tibetan grasslands. Now, you know, we don't really need to go too deep into that because, you know, uh, as, you know, um, people uh, who are already following the Tibet issue, you know, um, they already know that, you know, how there is a growing scientific body of research um, um, that um, the, the, the nomads uh, lifestyle um, way of life is actually in, uh, crucial to the health of the Tibetan ecosystem, the Tibetan grasslands and the nomads. And as we have seen, they have lived on the grasslands for thousands of years. Um, so this, this issue of land degradation, uh, that, that's, you know, it's not true. That's number one. Second thing the Chinese government is saying is that they are, you know, trying to help elevate poverty in the nomadic community. Again, you know, if you look at, as you know, you and I know, you know the nomads, the nomads feel that they are actually worse off when they are removed from the grasslands. You know, for Tibetan nomads, they feel their lives are fulfilled. They, you know, their spiritual well-being is being taken care of. They live a, you know, highly self-sufficient life when they are, you know, free on the range. And it's only when they are removed from the grassland that they feel, you know, deprived. They feel, you know, stripped off from their livelihoods, uprooted from their a land from the ancestral land, and that's when they feel that they are, you know, worse off, um, and that's when they feel start, you know, facing all these social economic challenges in, in this alien new environment. And the third thing is, you know, is biodiversity, which is a big thing for China these days. You know, China has developed this new interest in protecting biodiversity, and and now the question is, you know. Uh, does it really necessitate the, the removal of nomads uh, from, the, from the grasslands? You know, Tibetan nomads uh, have protected the grassland. They, you know, to, as we know that, you know, Tibet's grasslands um, is an important grassland. It's one of the most important grasslands in the world, you know, and it is the nomads who have looked up the grasslands. It is the nomads, you know, who have looked up the rivers, you know, uh, the, the, the rivers, um, the, the, some of the major rivers, you know, the grasslands, they are located on the banks of these rivers. Um, so basically, you know, all these arguments uh, that are putting forward by China, um, they are not stacking up, so they must be challenged. So yes, just to add, add to that, sorry, I, I just had, uh, I just wanted to add one, one thought to that. The problem with, you know, this whole thing about protecting biodiversity is that, you know, when China unleashes this, uh, unveils this new system of national parks in, in, in Tibet, it is very likely that, you know, a lot of international um, agencies will, you know, pat China on its back and say, you know, you're doing a good job. So we have to ensure that, you know, the international community doesn't get swayed by this you know, green rhetoric that is coming from China. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to yeah, add that point about China's green rhetoric and how you know we can actually call it China's green colonialism in Tibet. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's very right. Uh, where you know they they invest lots of. Uh, money and there is lots of uh, advertisement in the Chinese news medias who says that you know national parks are you know like that protects the environment and people and I feel that uh, you know uh, as you said you know the green uh, uh, projects where I see that as uh, you know the Chinese policy of a beautification of Tibetan landscape and uh, then completely ignoring the ecosystem and the livelihood of the Tibetans 
Uh, so my next question is to Simon uh, and uh, why the protection of Tibet's environment and the, and the billions of people who depend on it requires upholding the knowledge, culture and the rights of Tibetans. Thank you. Um, look, I can probably be quite brief here because I think, um, you know, Kinzum has already provided much of the answer here um, very, very convincingly. Um, so I, I don't want to restate uh, all of that, but um, it maybe is just worth um, starting by reaffirming, and I'm, I know this is well known probably to most people um, during this conversation, but what happens in Tibet matters so much for the region and by extension, the entire world. So we're talking about direct impacts upon Tibetans, but um, you know, direct impacts upon the, um, the climate struggle more broadly and the ability of people on all these populous countries downstream to be able to uh, flourish and prosper. Um, I think as we know, it's well known now, uh, the importance of Tibet is the source of um, you know, the rivers that you know, run through almost all the major rivers of Asia. Also its role in uh, driving the Asian monsoon that perhaps even more people you know, depend on um, for their sustenance. And it's also, and maybe this is slightly less known, a globally significant store of um, carbon in the land, just the same way the great forests are. There's a massive amount of uh, carbon sequestered in the Tibetan grassland environment. And so for all these reasons, that role in the carbon cycle, that role in uh, fresh water, it's very important. And um, as we, we've touched on, we've seen very rapid changes there, um, very sort of clumsy uh, development projects, uh, over-exploitation of the plateau that um, have caused all sorts of uh, environmental degradation with all sorts of consequences for Tibetans and, and people in the region. And so why then does the protection of Tibet depend on upholding knowledge, culture, and rights of Tibetans? Well, I think as uh, Kinza has just explained very well, um, Tibetan nomads in particular, also small-scale Tibetan farmers, have been part of Tibet's ecosystem for a very long time. And of course, have uh, not just survived, but um, you know, flourished sustainably over a, a long period. And um, it's that kind of um, symbiosis, I guess, between Tibetan nomads and farmers and the Tibetan environment at large that has protected that crucially important area that sort of maintained that stability has maintained that biodiversity, has uh, um, uh, in, ensured that it's remained a environment that um, you know, Tibetans have been able to, to thrive on, but that also has helped protect the headwaters of those rivers, that store of carbon, uh, everything else that we're now seeing uh, being degraded. So um, I think it's, it's obviously a point we keep circling back to, but um, it's really only, and you could apply the same argument in other parts of the world, by upholding and protecting um, that uh, knowledge that's enabled that sustainability and the values that have underpinned it and uh, the, the practices of, in the case of Tibet, just sort of light, sustainable grazing, low impact uh, uh, you know, use of the plateau and uh, putting that decision-making back in the hands of Tibetans or at least enabling them to be full participants in uh, decisions about Tibet's future. And the other point to make, and we took quite a deep dive into this with the report last year, an iron fist in a green glove. That doesn't mean foregoing all the good things about modernity. That doesn't mean you can't have, you know, the good healthcare and education and, and prosperity that we, that we all want to have. Um, you can have all those things. It's really about that freedom to be able to choose the components of your own life and to determine your own future, to be able to continue to look after your country and live sustainably. And because of Tibet's importance, the ability of Tibetans to do that um, it's so much better for all the rest of us as well. Uh, thank you, Simon. Uh, so my uh, next question is to Kinzum. So you earlier in your uh, like uh, presentation, you talked about uh, water uh, conservation and the biodiversity, uh, you know, conservation protection uh, in Tibet. And then um, we have a grassland degradations that is also, you know, we, we see in Tibet. So how do you see that along with the tackling the global climate crisis? How do you see that, you know, how can we say that, you know, the protection of Tibet's biodiversity or the water conservation can go hand in hand with the uh, 
uh, tackling the you know, global climate, climate crisis? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, biodiversity protection, development, human rights, all these things, um, they are not mutually exclusive from one another. In fact, they are mutually you know, reinforcing. And, and that applies not just to Tibet or it applies to every place in the world. And especially in the, and, and of course, if you look at the history of, um, history of environmental destruction or overconsumption, which has led to today's ecological crisis, you will see that you know, this environmental destruction has been accompanied by colonization, has been accompanied by forced displacement of people from their ancestral land. And so, and, and that has been playing out in Tibet. Uh, you know, when we look at the climate crisis in, in Tibet, it's not just an environmental issue. It has to be understood in the political context. It has to be looked at through the lens of colonization. So human rights uh, and development must indeed go hand in hand in Tibet. And of course, the first step towards ensuring that we have an ecologically um, sustainable and a socially um, equitable path in Tibet is ensuring that the you know, rights of the Tibetan people, you know, the, whose land and whose culture are under stake, um, are protected. And, and the good news is that actually, when you are protecting the rights of the Tibetan people, you are also ensuring that the Tibetan environment is also protected. Um, so yes, it is, it is not, not a either or choice, you know, these have to go hand in hand. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Kinzom. Uh, so, and my final uh, questions to both Kinzom and uh, Simon is that uh, we would be focusing on the international climate negotiations. And when we look at the international climate negotiation and then role of China in the international climate negotiation, so everyone has kind of this impression that, uh, you know, China is the leader of global climate uh, negotiation. They take active, uh, uh, you know, participation or active role but uh, an irony is that whatever, uh, when we look inside Tibet, I mean, we don't see that the Chinese leadership in terms of environment protection in Tibet. Uh, and uh, for years and years, the Tibet's environment are degrading and the, so much of, as Kinzo mentioned earlier, you know, so much of economic development that has brought up and that is causing environment destructions in, in Tibet. So like, Simon, during your experience of international climate negotiation, uh, how, according to you, how can the Tibetans, you know, they build a strategic alliance with the other, you know, climate uh, vulnerable people or how the Tibetans can be part of the global movement for climate justice? Sure. Um, look, I know Kinzam will talk um, directly to her experience at the most recent round of negotiations. She has rather more recent um, experience than I do. But um, look, I think we, we tend to think of the Tibetan situation as, as, as unique. And I mean, it is unique in many important respects. I think because of the sheer significance of Tibet, because of the level of enduring uh, repression there and, and, and so forth. But that said, there are um, sadly, a lot of commonalities with um, various other environmental struggles around the world, whether it's uh, tribes, people in the Amazon, uh, whether it's um, in pretty much anywhere where you have authoritarian governments or uh, a big legacy of colonization, um, you know, people have to really fight uh, to, to defend their lands, to, um, uh, to ensure they can practice their culture and traditional livelihoods. And so those fights can be very, very dangerous. Dangerous as a, a rise in uh, you know the uh, the number of environmental defenders who have disappeared and faced very severe consequences. Anyway, I don't want to dwell too much on that very uh, dark stuff because the point I wanted to make is there actually a lot of natural allies that Tibetans have in many different parts of the world who are facing this common challenge of of uh, having to um, uh, you know fight uh, to have control of their land to be able to be part of the solutions, to be able to have also obviously their livelihoods and dignity. 
Um, one of the encouraging things in the last couple of rounds of climate negotiations, which you know, well, can otherwise be a bit of a train wreck, but one of the positive trends is we've seen, I think a much stronger indigenous caucus, a much more organized um, uh, block of um, these kinds of uh, communities and movements who are not represented well by their governments, but who are able to band together and, and push together for climate justice. We would have seen it even more had the last COP been in Lima, um, I think when it was moved to Madrid, uh, some of the presence we'd seen there from the Latin American um, indigenous peoples didn't happen as much as it would. But it's a trend that we've seen is a much stronger block and movement of united indigenous peoples. And so I think the first thing is that Tibetans have so much to bring to that broader movement because of their particular situation. And I think so much also um, that can gain from being, and of course, yourself and others have been doing a lot of this work, but I think there's lots more that can be can be doing all of us to build those strategic alliances with um, you know, the many human rights and environmental defenders around the world who face similar challenges. So that's one, one fairly obvious point. Um, another thing I think is worth considering at the moment, given this very peculiar moment in history we're in with the coronavirus crisis, is that we don't know exactly how this is gonna play out for China, for the Chinese government. Of course, they're working very hard at the moment to control the story around it and to position themselves as, you know, saviors of the world somehow. But it's quite possible that, you know, they will be, the government will be weakened, not only reputationally, but in other ways, in how this affects global geopolitics. It may be a bit of a retreat from the sort of uh, globalization and interdependence, dependence that a lot of countries have on China, which means we might have reached a sort of zenith in terms of, China's stranglehold on some of these UN treaty bodies. Um, maybe we haven't, uh, but I think that's another optimistic thing uh, to think about is that um, we're gonna see some quite interesting shifts in the global sort of balance of power and these sort of geopolitical dynamics coming out of this period that we're in. Um, we don't know how that's gonna play out, but it's not necessarily gonna work out well for the Chinese government. So um, it's possible that uh, when we go into these next rounds of negotiations on climate change under the Paris Agreement or everything, anything else, we might actually see China's ability to really dominate those diminished a little bit. And I think we will also continue to see a stronger uh, movement, popular movement, uh, led not by countries and states, but led by united peoples around the world, for climate justice in a broad sense, and that very much being led by First Peoples, by Indigenous peoples and young peoples, and of course, you know, Tibetans are um, very much a part of that. Thank you, Simon. And to you raise a very important and very, I would say, you know, the positive note of uh, how, you know, United Indigenous people and how civil society can play important role in, in terms of climate uh, change solutions. And uh, then now my uh, final question is to Kinzum. And uh, so as uh, uh, I asked uh, Simon regarding the international climate negotiation, and uh, recently in COP 25th, uh, you have also attended the UN Climate Change Summit uh, in Spain. And uh, and you have also written, uh, you know, uh, uh, a bit of a report on that. And I was also like, uh, I, I could also able to attend uh, the COP meeting in, in France. And uh, so my experience for that was, uh, you know, I mean, there is lots of scope as Simon mentioned earlier, but sometimes, you know, it's like a bit very disheartening uh, for me personally, because when we, when I went to talk about climate, so there are like very few people who know, who know Tibet. So, and then everyone is so busy at that uh, conference and everyone has come to uh, come, come there at the conference to share their, uh, you know, environment challenges. And then when we go there and represent Tibet where, you know, people have a really very limited knowledge where Tibet is. And when they say Tibet, uh, they only think of His Holiness the Dalai Lama or either the Buddhism. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, I mean, the Tibet groups in Paris also have worked hard and, uh, but then, I mean, uh, like Kinzum, like how was your experience uh, and uh, 
can you please share us your experience with us? Yeah, sure. I mean, I had the exactly same feelings. Um, so I share your sentiments wholly, you know, how frustrating it is, you know, uh, to be not being able to, you know, share our story, not getting our voices heard and feeling um, this sense of despair and, you know, uh, frustration um, at the lack of opportunity. And uh, so, um, but then, you know, I, I returned from COP, uh, this most recent COP, you know, feeling that there is a lot of work for us that needs to be done, you know, a lot of work for the Tibet movement, for the Tibetan people. Um, and, and, and first of all, we have to understand that this campaign on the environment or the climate crisis, it's, it's, not, a sh it's not a short term campaign. You know, the whole movement has to um, prepare for a long term campaign and that, and we can't expect quick results. And, and if we expect that, you know, the COP25 or the UN climate conference is the end all and the be all of, you know, of our campaign, then we are going to come back feeling quite frustrated. So we have to go into that kind of a conference thinking that we are not going to achieve quick results, that this is part of a long-term campaign. Um, and part of that long-term campaign is, you know, building, investing in relationship building, investing in, you know, building strategic alliances, as, you know, as, as we've talked about earlier, Simon talked about the importance of the, or the growing strength, growing power of the indigenous caucus, the indigenous voices, you know, people fighting for climate justice. And so there is this huge kind of potential for us to, you know, build our relationship with these communities, with, with these indigenous communities who have come from a similar background of colonization, of, you know, um, of, you know, having to deal with um, displacement, um, overconsumption, uh, all that stuff. Um, so it's, it's about us being able to, you know, tell our story better. It's about us being able to find that intersection of, um, of climate change and human rights. And, and, and also, as you said, you know, it, it was a huge conference, you feel a bit lost. So it's really about us you know, understanding um, the processes that are happening there. And it's not just you know, showing up in COP, but also the months and years leading up to a significant you know, international moment like that. So yes, basically it is, it, we have to be prepared. It's a, it's a big piece of work for the Tibet movement. Uh, thank you, Kinsom. Uh, so I think over here, you raised a very important uh, point where you know, we can build us, uh, like you were, you were focusing about investing in strategic alliance with the indigenous communities and then you were also saying that uh, you know the the campaign for environment or climate change is not a very short term campaign it should be a long term campaign and uh, i think that's very important that sometimes you know uh, we when when we talk about environment you know we want you know everything the result in a very uh, in a very short term so i think right now we have to bet groups working on the um, campaign on climate change and environment issues. And I hope there will be more of uh, Tibet groups and uh, other groups joining with us and then bringing up the questions. Uh, so that's my question. And uh, thank you, Simon and Kinzum. So now uh, I will be, we have uh, got uh, so many questions over here. And uh, so, uh, I will be reading out a few questions. Uh, and uh, so my uh, first question is to Kinzum. So uh, here, I mean, we have one of the, you know, the participant, uh, he says that we have seen uh, an escalation of environment protests around the world. And I'm interested to know if Tibetans in Tibet are protesting about environment issues. And if so, then what happens to them? Yes, definitely. First of all, it is you know so encouraging to see this you know growing movement. You know, especially young people being involved in this movement. You know, kind of leading the movement. Um, and yes, absolutely. In Tibet, 
there has always been, you know, resistance led by the Tibetan people, especially the nomads, you know, uh, fighting for their land, fighting to protect their environment. And, and, and the sad reality is that, you know, Tibetans live in a highly repressive environment where people do not have the freedom to protest and any act of, you know, um, even an environmental activity organizing to defend your own land and environment can be are, you know, treated as political activities. And which is why you know, we have people, as we speak, people like Anya Sengta, a nomad and a community organizer who has protested against China's mining activities in Tibet, you know, facing seven years in prison as we speak. And just next week, he's going to face trial. Um, and there has been a series of incidents over the last many years in Tibet where Tibetans have, you know, have resisted against China's mining activities. Tibetans, we have a long history uh, of, you know, uh, protecting our land, um, you know, especially the nomads. And if you look at the self-immolations um, in Tibet, uh, a significant number of them uh, are actually from a nomadic uh, background. So there are many instances, and there are also many instances of, um, you know, um, protests which have proven successful. You know, in cases where nomads have been able to, where protests um, uh, have been, have led to, um, you know, um, mining projects being cancelled. Um, you know, so things like that are happening. Unfortunately, again, because of the lack of information that is coming out, we don't get all the stories in the media, but there is definitely a lot of um, activity happening um, in the environment space. And it is very important, not just as protests, but also a lot of community-based initiatives that are happening inside Tibet, um, you know, working to protect uh, the local um, environment. So yes, definitely. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, that's very true. I mean, uh, so uh, when we talk about uh, like uh, human rights and then environment, as Kim Jong said that, you know, how the environmental protests, protesters are treated by the Chinese government. So when we talk from the human rights perspective, I feel that, you know, the, uh, the environment protesters they should also be provided a freedom of expression. They should be allowed to give a space where they can also raise their voices. And as Kenzo, you also mentioned earlier, how Tibetans are brutally, brutally treated by the government when they talk about environment issues in, in, in Tibet. And uh, so the next question that we have is from Facebook. And I think I'll ask this to Simon, uh, because earlier, you know, you were talking about um, uh, the coronavirus and how that will impact Chinese uh, government's, uh, you know, uh, Im global image or how that will change the role of China in a international climate change or international relations. So over here, uh, one of our, uh, you know, participants says, we are obviously all living in a new type of world and the coronavirus. And this appears to be impacting global trust in China. I would like to know if you think there is a window of opportunity to seek support from the international community to stop China's plundering of Tibet's and uh, Tibet environment. Well, I think, so, uh, well, I think um, we're going to see probably, and we're already seeing it, I think greater scrutiny on China and questioning of uh, you know, China's governance, ideology, um, activities, which is probably going to open a window of opportunity to pursue the whole spectrum of things that, that matter to, to the Tibet movements, um, including um, uh, the Tibet's environments and the displacement of nomads and, and, and so forth, all the issues we've been covering here. I think it's easy when dealing with such a challenging issue to be grasping for these seeds of optimism um because things don't always play out the way we expect but um what's interesting uh from where kinton and i am is that australia has often been one of the countries least willing to um, we have a lot of economic interdependence with china we've not had very strong political leaders who are willing to um uh you know speak very publicly about um uh, china's um failings, whether it's in Tibet, around human rights, or around environmental protection, but 
just the last few days, few weeks, we've seen some um, the sorts of comments from our um, political leaders here, including our foreign minister, which I haven't seen before. You know, <laughs> really quite bullshit comments um, uh, pointed at uh, at China, and uh, which is interesting, and I think does signal that um, uh, the number of countries including the sort of big Western democracies probably are gonna be wanting to go after China a bit more on a few fronts. And um, that naturally should open up a window of opportunity, you know, to be pursuing uh, these issues we're talking about today around Tibet's environment and around uh, uh, rights for Tibet's nomads among others. I hope, mm -hmm. <laughs> as I'm sure we all do. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Simon. Uh... So the next question that we have, I think I'll ask this to Kinzo. So the next question is, what is the situation with the damming in Interbet? And I read recently about the Megong drying up and this being linked to dams in Tibet. So is this true? Yeah, so the damming situation is again, one of the you know, more um, um, serious uh, issues that is facing uh, the Tibetan people and the Tibetan land and our environment. And I, I'm sure, you know, they will, it, it is a big discussion. And I think, uh, you know, I'm, I, I can't say I'm an expert on, on this issue per se, but, you know, of course, uh, China, uh, as it is, you know, investing so much in developing infrastructure, like the roads and the railways, likewise, it is you know, building dams uh, across the major Tibetan rivers, which is having serious consequences, uh, not just on the Tibetan local Tibetan environment and the Tibetan people, because it means replacing, you know, the local population, the local uh, people from the land, uh, but also having serious consequences on, on the billions of people living in the downstream countries. For instance, the, the Mekong example that you just cited, you know, it's something that we have always talked about how China's control over Tibet's rivers and Tibet's water resource um, can cause you know, significant geopolitical issues. And it is already doing that, you know, uh, as we have just recently read, seen this new study about how the drought in Southeast Asia is actually a result, a direct result of the damming that China is, you know, um, doing you know, along the Tibetan rivers. Um, so yes, I, I mean, I, I would be really keen to have a separate um, webinar on this, you know, <laughs> um, the implications and the full um, extent of China's damming project in Tibet. One thing I might add, if I may, and unfortunately is a bit of a counterbalance to the sort of optimistic note about opportunities that might emerge out of the awful thing that is the coronavirus crisis is that it's also possible that um, China, since it's had taken an economic hit, is going to want to start doubling down again on a lot of big infrastructure, um, potentially resource projects, uh, damming fossil fuel projects and so on as a means to uh, start kickstarting its economy. Of course, it has all sorts of other opportunities through renewable energy and environmental sustain environmentally sustainable solutions, but it might be that we see some moves back in that direction as well. And it also might be that there's less scrutiny on that because the world's still very preoccupied with, with, with COVID-19. So the risk of um, a lot of bad stuff happening under the radar. So it's certainly a time when we have to be very vigilant about um, you know, new projects and including hydroelectric dams. Mm, yeah, uh, thank you. And uh, the next question, I think I would ask this to Simon. And here it says, I know that the Tibetan plateau is vital for carbon capture. Can you explain to me some more about how this works and why Tibet is so important when it talks about carbon capture? Mm. Um, when I was lucky to visit Tibet some years ago now, um, one thing that struck me was how intensely green <laughs> A lot of the areas I was able to visit were certainly in the east. I mean, there's very um, lush forest. A lot of Tibet is you know, more grassland and shrubland, and then some of it is very arid alpine desert. But um, uh, it's, as you three would know better than I, but uh, it is, among other things, one of the systems and grasslands like forests, like mangroves, and natural stores of a lot of carbon in the soil and in the vegetation. Um, and as I think we touched on, um, the traditional modes of uh, nomadic grazing and small scale farming were very important in maintaining that. 
you know, the cycle of grazing, uh, which wasn't degrading the landscape. It was actually, um, you know, maintaining not only the biodiversity, but that rich store of carbon. And then the whole series of policy mistakes we've seen really over the last, um, uh, you know, since the invasion of Tibet has uh, you know, led to a lot of that being degraded. And so that then sets up some of these vicious cycles that we're all aware of when it comes to climate, where you start releasing that carbon from the soil, from the grasslands in this case, because they're being overgrazed or eroded or exploited in different ways. And then you're fueling more warming, which is then driving further changes, um, you know, the melting and drying of the plateau. But I think the thing we always wanna stress in these conversations is that there's then a potentially potentially a role if people have secure land tenure and everything else to be going through that slow process of restoring um, uh, ecosystems and beginning to draw carbon back down from the atmosphere through restoring grasslands. And uh, we talk about that a lot in Australia about how we can uh, rehabilitate a lot of the land lost to bushfires. And there's nobody better place to do that than Tibetans in Tibet and potentially there's sources of new livelihood and income streams and everything else there through you know carbon markets and payment for eco services uh, so um, but these are all the things that are just not um, being realized given the political situation in Tibet. Uh, yeah I think uh, that's very true and uh, so when we talk also talk about carbon capture, I think permafrost also plays a very important role in terms of uh, you know the capturing the carbon uh, dioxide. And so in, in Tibet, with the rise of temperature, we have seen uh, you know the permafrost degrade, uh, degrading, and uh, so that also has will have a major impact and I think the large, um, you know, uh, the roads of uh, the railway lines are built on the permafrost and there has been lots of news saying that, you know, the that will have a building a railway line, the Hasa Kormo railway line building on the permafrost will have a huge negative impact you know, to the environment as such. Uh, so I think the next question that we have, I think I'll ask to Kinzum. So uh, it says, I heard you talked about the parks in Tibet. What does that uh, really mean? And how can we do to help stop them if they are not helping Tibetans? So what it means um, is that, you know, in Tibet, as of now, you know, China has already designated many areas of Tibet as protected areas, you know, in the form of nature reserves or in the form of UNESCO World Heritage Listed Properties. You know, so there are many areas that are already labeled under, you know, given different labels, uh, all in the name of you know, protecting the different environment. Um, so what, under, under this new national park system, uh, a lot of these you know, protected areas will be regrouped or rebranded or upgraded to this new standard of national parks. Likewise, a lot of um, other areas or other, you know, yes, other areas will be redrawn and kind of you know, incorporated under this new system. Now, as I said earlier, of course, you know, national parks in principle, you know, they are good. They are meant to protect, you know, our, our environment to, you know, help us protect our biodiversity. But in China or in Tibet, the problem is China's national park in Tibet has a darker side, which is it includes removing the people, the very same people from the land, the very same people who have looked after the land, you know. So it could, that could possibly, you know, basically, you know, finish China's project of displacing Tibet's nomads from the, from, from sorry, the Tibetan plateau. So, sorry, that was the Siri talking to me somehow. <laughs> Siri thought I was <laughs> giving the Siri some command, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> um, so, you know, under this national park, so what will happen to the national park? So this is a serious issue, you know, China is basically, you know, taking ownership of this Tibetan land, Tibetan landscape, this beautiful grassland, huge, you know, expanse of the Tibetan plateau, and possibly, you know, repurposing it for mass, to attract mass tourism, you know, uh, so the danger is Tibet will further become a more attractive destination for the rising middle class um, 
Chinese population, you know, who will come to Tibet, who will have no respect for the local culture, who will trivialize Tibetan culture, and tourism, as we know, it's problematic. China's tourism in Tibet is problematic. You know, China doesn't allow international tourists to visit Tibet, but it allows its own citizens to, you know, go to Tibet and, you know, see this kind of sanitized uh, view of uh, version of Tibet. You know, China's tourism in Tibet is focused on scenic spots. You know, they are not focused on, you know, having real interaction with the local people and understanding the real culture. It's based either based on these, you know, monasteries or, you know, or on these scenic spots. So basically this will become um, a, a bigger tourist destination for, for, for the rising middle class in Tibet, um, in, in China. And um, so that's, that's problematic. And the Tibetan people, you know, um, the nomads who are displaced from them, the China, Chinese government is promising that many of them will uh, get employment. Yes, you know, as we can see from one of the major, the main, um, uh, the national park, there have been people who have um, got jobs uh, to work in the national parks. But again, as we can see in every other industry or every other sector in Tibet, you know, it's the Tibetans who are taking the lower ranks of this new you know, industry. The Chinese are taking on the higher you know, positions. Um, and so basically and the main problem is that, you know, why should uh, the national parks uh, necessitate the removal, if it is about really protecting biodiversity, it's the Tibetan people who have looked about our environment. You know, it's the nomads who have looked about the Tibetan people. The Tibetan nomads, their knowledge, their traditional knowledge, their local knowledge should be respected and should be incorporated into this new system. So our job is to ensure that these nomads get a fair deal, that their, um, their, their local knowledge, their you know, traditional knowledge is respected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, you, you raised a really important uh, question about uh, uh, the role of Tibetan uh, nomads and uh, what happens when they are removed. And uh, it's sometimes uh, it seems like a, you know, a big promise. And then in reality, you know, that doesn't really uh, serve the purpose of um, Tibetans. And when we say about, you know, I mean, economic development, so normally many people ask um, the development for whom, whom, who is benefiting from this development. And I think this is a very important discussions. And I think Kinzum, I, I realize that you have uh, raised uh, lots of issues on Tibetan nomads. And I think maybe in future we can have a specific webinar talking about uh, nomads relocation, how that impacts on grassland or and how that changes the livelihoods of nomads. And um, so we have another question from Facebook. Uh, I think uh, uh, I'll, I'll ask to Simon, uh, what are your thoughts on shifting narrative from Tibetan plateau as the third pole to the Hindu Kush Himalayan region, which is now also identified as third pole? Uh, does the new narrative affect the us or could it lead to our advantage? It's an interesting question. I mean, I think the uh, probably campaigner in me thinks that you know simplicity in communications is important, and um, a lot I think of progress has been made in um, you know really cementing the notion of Tibet as as the Earth's third pole, and you know using Tibet in a pretty expansive sense. Um, you know, arguably, it could be more accurate to talk about the Hindu Kush Himalaya. Um, I think perhaps we can talk about both. Um, I think, you know, a big sort of shift in narrative when you're partway through really trying to sort of bring awareness to something can be a little bit tricky. Um, I, I can't say I have a strong view on that. And I think it's probably one that, you know, needs to be decided by people from Tibet and from the broader region how they want things to be termed rather than being a question for a you know observer like myself so um certainly interested in any thoughts on that one uh yeah and uh, even uh, like our tibet networks uh, facebook page is called tibet third pole 
<laughs> and yeah, I mean, Tibet, uh, Tibetan, some, some people I think uh, when I was uh, studying at university, you know, it's like uh, very uh, interesting to say when we were talking about Tibet. And then while I was doing presentation on Tibet, Tibetan Plato, so one of the professor asked me saying that, uh, why are you calling uh, Tibetan Plato? You know, why can't you just call Tibet Tibet as uh, the according to the Chinese where they call Tibet as Tibet to the Tibet Autonomous Region. So even um, and sometimes in the universities, you know, we get restrictions and uh, sometimes, you know, the professors, they ask us to not call Tibet as Tibetan Plato, but then China's Tibet or Tibet mm -hmm. Autonomous Region. So it's a, yeah, it's a so many challenges that we, we face nowadays, even, even in uh, the so-called free country. Uh, so the next question that we have is from Facebook and uh, Kinzum, uh, you were talking about the Tibetans participation in UN climate change. So here uh, the question is, says, I understand that Tibetans and groups are working to get Tibet uh, raised at the COP meetings, but is there any actual you know, action from the UN on Tibet's environment? Yeah, um, on that, I mean, the exact um, nature of, you know, COP, these COP conferences, uh, I would like to ask Simon to, you know, shed more light on that, you know, what exactly does COP does, but, you know, like any UN institution, uh, it is very important. These are, you know, these institutions, uh, international institutions where, you know, countries from all around the world are coming together to address, you know the, the the major challenges of our time and it's so important that when tibet is on the forefront of the global climate crisis it's important that we that our voices are heard um at the un at the at the un climate conference uh, and and the sad reality right now is that you know we we, we are not represented you know we are all, our voices are not heard and that's what we are trying to do, you know, go there, uh, you know, trying to, you know, find every opportunity to, you know, get our voices heard, uh, try to, uh, to, to, you know, build these alliances with the various communities who are attending these conferences. So these are significant, but as I said earlier, there is a lot of work for us. Uh, and, but on the exact nature of what it can potentially do for Tibet, I would like to ask Simon to, uh, if you can say, Bit more on that, Simon. Well, we have been um, we've been talking a bit about this between us because I know it is one of the key aims of the the campaign work this year, and um, there certainly are ways in which um, could get Tibet raised by Tibetan in a much more kind of central and powerful way in in, in you know at a COP or in another UN climate negotiation, uh, because although it is essentially a negotiation between parties or countries. I mean, sometimes we talk about the UN as a sort of entity in itself, but really it is just, you know, a collection of all the countries in the world. Um, and, uh, but then you also have, um, you know, various observer organizations who are able to participate in various ways, including within the actual plenary formal negotiations. So I think doing it through one of those observer organizations, and that would take a lot of the groundwork that Kinzum's talking about, you know, over the months, years leading up to a big COP to be sort of working one's way in there and sort of uh, uh, campaigning successfully for this to be something that really needs to be raised through that, you know, whatever slots are available to observers, but that's certainly possible. The other, I think, is to work with one of the, um, uh, I guess like-minded governments, you know, uh, countries that have a major stake in what happens in Tibet, um, and you know, certainly no reason why a Tibetan representative couldn't be part of another country delegation. Um, I don't know if that's mm -hmm. happened in the past. It may have done. You're then having to deal with the sort of dynamics we touched on of, you know, the the influence of China within these uh, within any kind of UN process, and I think especially within the climate negotiations where all the climate vulnerable countries and countries of the global south are actually together in the group of 77 plus China. 
And so, you know, a, a country would essentially have to break from that block if it really wanted to sort of push hard on Tibetan issues. I mean, I think nothing is impossible, but I think, um, as Kinzen says, understanding the process and the dynamics and figuring out the opportunities we have to really bring focus not just onto Tibet and its importance, but onto everything we've talked about today about the importance of uh, rights and self-determination for Tibetans and all and indigenous peoples being part of the solution. It's possible, but I think we've got to think about it quite creatively, um, but it's certainly possible. I think the, the other point just to mention there, and I think you, you uh, Kinza mentioned this, is that we don't get too myopically focused on the, the UN process. Um, it's an important part of tackling climate change, which requires a global solution. But, you know, I think arguably, um, <laughs> for better or worse, we're seeing the sort of whole global rule-based order change and diminish a little bit. And perhaps ongoing, these UN processes may not be as important as in the past. They certainly will remain important, but there are all sorts of opportunities and levers we have outside of, um, you know, UN processes as well when we come to tackling these issues. It was a fairly long answer. I hope that's uh, <laughs> been of some use. No, 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 no thank you. Uh, thank you. And uh, uh, it's almost like midnight to Kinzom and Simon right now. So uh, we'll be just taking uh, two, two last questions. And uh, I would, uh, so any of you can ask. Uh, the first question is, uh, regarding will the Belt and Road Initiative go through Tibet and will it affect the environment? So um, I, I, I am hoping that um, Lobsang, if you can help us uh, with this question, but what I want to say is, you know, um, I have to admit that I really don't have a full understanding of this, how this initiative will directly impact uh, Tibet. But what we do know is that a lot of development infrastructure, you know, that China is focusing on right now, you know, the damming projects, all these things are linked to Xi Jinping's, you know, uh, Belt and Road Initiative. These are being built to facilitate and to, you know, support uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. So yes, um, so, uh, Lopsang, would you like to add more on that? Uh, I think uh, for me, I mean, uh, you know, the, the Belt and Road Initiative is very recent uh, Chinese uh, government's uh, economic development initiative, uh, not only in Tibet, but as a whole. And I think when it talks about Belt and Road, I think for me, and there is like two narratives, uh, two school of thought where one school of thought says that, you know, the, the Belt and Road Initiative will have a lot of impact on Tibet. And uh, this will also, in the name of Belt and Road uh, Initiative, there will be lots of infrastructure development and uh, that, that will not only impact the neighboring countries, but also the uh, like uh, downstream nations. And when we look at Tibet with the Nepal and the Chinese are building up lots of roads and railway links. And uh, from strategic point of view, that will also have a ge uh, geopolitical impact. But then I think uh, the other school of thought where says that, you know, when we look at the Chinese government's uh, economic development, so which is called Western Development Campaign, which uh, kind of, uh, you know, initiated in the early uh, 2000s. And uh, so this Western Development Campaign also includes the infrastructure development, the mining, the dam, and then, uh, you know, the economic relations. And then that also kind of, uh, you know, I mean, we see that, you know, uh, like all the infrastructure development uh, comes under, you know, the Western uh, development campaign that they have already started in early 2000s. So it's like, um, yeah, it's like a bit confusing. And I feel that uh, right now it's an initial phase and we have much more to study and to see, but definitely, you know, China is bringing lots of economic development and uh, economic development, especially at the border areas. And that also creates uh, lots of nervous to India and uh, to Nepal. But right now, you know, Nepal and uh, uh, the Lhasa, the, the so-called Tibet Autonomous uh, Region seems to have a good the trading partner. And so I think uh, we need to have a, a more study and more uh, like uh, uh, 
the patient, you know, keen observation on that issue. I think this Belt and Road Initiative, uh, the question has been also raised in the previous uh, hour during our first uh, discussion on climate change, uh, like on a natural uh, disaster as well. So on this, uh, like uh, for the Belt and Road Initiative, Simon, do you have uh, anything more to share on that? Or we can go to the other question, last question. Um, no, nothing to build on, <laughs> on your two wisdom. Thank you. Sure. Uh, so the final question uh, is, is, I think, is very important. Uh, and this question is to both uh, uh, Kinzom and Simon. Uh, so when we sometimes when we look at uh, Tibet, uh, you know, sometimes we tend to look at Tibet as only a human rights issue or Tibet as just seen as the environment issue. But uh, can we, I mean, you know, like do, like do we have a practical to address the Tibet problem as it surely must be looked as a whole, you know, problem rather than just the human rights or just the environment problem. So how can we address the Tibet problem as a whole by not looking just as a environment or human rights problem? So I mean, do you want to start first? Um, sure, then um, you, you, you can have the last words. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I mean, I, I think that's the absolute crux of what we've been, you know, talking about today. The fact is that we, we have to look at these things as a whole. Um, and as we've always said in different ways, um, environmental issues and human rights issues are very much two sides of the same coin. Um, there's simply, I don't think, and I think we'd all agree, any way to get on top of the environmental challenges, the challenge of the climate crisis in Tibet or anywhere else, unless you have essential human rights, democratic freedoms, ability for people to determine their futures based on the way they've been able to live sustainably in the past, unless you have all of that, we're not going to deal with these problems. Um, the climate crisis is a human rights issue. And it's only through um, uh, protection and upholding of um, human rights that we are going to find a pathway through this. So I think probably uh, there's a clear picture there um, uh, that I think we all agree on very strongly. I think the challenge when you say then finding practical solutions is um, first of all, communicating that very effectively um, so that many more people um, grasp um, that, that essential truth. Uh, because it is a more complicated kind of message than sometimes we're used to sort of pushing. Um, and I think perhaps there uh, is maybe no one single path then we pursue, but it means that we can work skillfully, whether it's in the context of UN climate negotiations, whether it's in um, a whole range of other kind of political opportunities. Um, so we're playing to all those kind of dimensions of the Tibet issue, but always bringing it back to that one single story about how you know, what works and is essential to ensure a secure, dignified, free future for Tibetan people are also the same things that's necessary to protect Tibet's environment, both for Tibetans, obviously, but for the wider world. So, yeah, just to add to that, I mean, I totally agree with just what Simon and both yourself, uh, Lobsang, have, you know, uh, mentioned about how, you know, it is, the problem in Tibet is not just a human rights problem or it's not an environmental problem. We, we can't, you know, it's everything. It, all these issues are related to one another. You know, it is the great um, misfortune of Tibetans that, you know, uh, that we are having to deal with two very serious problems, you know, uh, one problem being very old, which is the problem of colonization the Chinese occupation and the other problem relatively in the new, let's say climate change. So, but both these two issues are so, you know, inherently connected with one another that we can't really talk about one um, issue in isolation. And so it's important for us, you know, when we try to talk about an environmental issue, we are able to talk about it in a political context, in a more holistic, um, context and 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 try to kind of you know um, join the dots 
you know, um, and, and talk about, join the thoughts about why Tibet matters, you know, to the global world, why the Tibetan people are suffering. And then, you know, being able to communicate that Tibetan people um, are not just the victims, uh, that we are, you know, survivors, that we are fighters, and, and that, you know, um, and then being able to inspire, you know, the whole world to join our movement. So, um, so yes, I think we are living in very interesting times now, you know, politics, geopolitics, um, in, it's, it's shifting uh, every day, every week. Um, you know, it's the battle of who can win this, you know, um, battle of narratives or stories, who can tell a better story. And right now with the coronavirus situation, um, and especially related to the environment, you know, there is a powerful story to tell, you know, and, and story about how uh, Chinese uh, values or uh, what China is doing, what Chinese policies are not compatible with Tibetan values. In the whole coronavirus thing issue, you know, we're talking about, basically we're talking about in our environment, you know. China's thinking is that we should, that man should conquer nature. Whereas the Tibetan worldview is exactly the opposite. Mm -hmm. Tibetan nomads, Tibetan people is about protecting environment. It's about protecting our land. You know, we may not have come from this kind of a Western environmental perspective, but we come from this, you know, um, from, from a Buddhism uh, worldview that, you know, wildlife is to be protected. Uh, environment is to be protected because it's where, you know, our deities live, it's where our water spirits reside. Uh, and, you know, it, it's where, it's because animals live in all these, you know, forests and all these grasslands, it's our responsibility as human beings, you know, to be compassionate towards other people and to, to be other sentient beings, you know. Whereas the Chinese thinking, the Chinese government's worldview is entirely different. It's entirely um, incompatible with our uh, worldview. So just as we are trying to you know, address um, the human rights crisis, um, the climate crisis, I think you know, fundamentally we have to work towards you know, decolonizing Tibet and, and, and only then can we achieve, I think, genuine freedom and genuine um, um, human rights. And I think right now, you know, um, it's an important time to tell a, a strong, powerful story about Tibet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think Kinzon, that's a very, uh, you know, the, the roadmap uh, I had for the Tibet issue. And you have clearly, and both the Simon and Kinzum, you have clearly uh, shared a very, uh, you know, I would say very clear vision for the Tibetans. And uh, so I think uh, here we would like to end our discussion and uh, Thank you so much, Kinzum and Simon, for joining us and your presentation, your view, your great work. And then that has been really helpful, very knowledgeable. And I'm sure, like not only me, I sh I'm sure that, you know, all our viewers have really, uh, like it has been really helpful for um, all of us. And then we would be keeping this as a live record and then it will be in our social media. And then later on, there will be more people watching it. And uh, so thank you so much. And uh, then I would also like to thank uh, our viewers for, you know, listening very patiently in and asking lots of questions. In fact, there were so many questions, but then we couldn't take all the questions. Uh, so maybe I think in next month, then we will have more discussions on, on this um, very important topic. So here I would like to end and thank you once again, Kinzum and Simon and all the viewers. Thank and, you. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Now thank I you. would like to, yeah, now I would like to hand over to Mandy for the concluding remarks. Thank you. That was an amazing discussion. Um, and it went on for an hour and a half, which which we weren't expecting. So thank you so much for staying up late. And thanks everyone for watching for so long. Um, it, we really did have a wealth of more information that I think could have been shared. And there were certainly uh, way too many questions for us to answer. 
directly in the discussion, but we will reply to them um, on the Facebook page. So please do keep them coming in and we will try and get as many answers to you as we can. Um, as we said at the start, this is a series of talks, Tibet Climate Crisis talks. Um, we have one more uh, th at the end of next week, which is part of our series um, for the month of April, and then we will be doing one monthly. Um, however, there is another extra special one happening this Friday, which, which isn't um, uh, organised by uh tibet network um but is organized by a group of uh tibet an organizations based in uh Dharamasala. and um if you look on the facebook page you'll be able to see that we will be broadcasting that again on friday and we have a special guest um who is a scholar based in the us a tibetan um academic who will be giving a lot of information about nomad resettlement uh, projects. It is going to be in Tibetan, um, so um, we will look to try and do the same one in English uh, slightly later on. We will also be looking to do one, as Kingsong was saying, on, on water um, and damming. We're going to be looking at one on, on Tibetan nomads. We're also going to be looking to do one with um, numerous uh, frontline defender communities, so different indigenous uh, communities as well, to have a discussion about how um, communities are dealing with climate crises in different areas, particularly in, in areas which are, are occupied or um, do not have a huge amount of say and um, uh, ability to, to get the governments to do what they want them to do. So the, these will all be coming up shortly. Um, I also wanted to very quickly touch on the, the two questions which in my mind are, are, are slightly linked, the one about the UN action and one about the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, and I touch on it because um, we do some work with the Tibet Advocacy Coalition who do a lot of work um, with the UN Human Rights Council and there has been a, a briefing written recently about the Belt and Road Initiative and the impacts that it is going to have and is already having in Tibet, um, particularly on the nomadic communities with, with rail, railways and roads being built. Um, we are, we are, that is a UN briefing, we are going to be um, making that available it will be on the website shortly so people can see um, some answers to the questions that were raised and, and also the discussions that are being had with UN, uh, UN experts on the environment and on, on different um, issues kind of linked to the environment and linked to, to, um, to Tibet. Um, very quickly, I want to share my screen with you just to show you um, the website that we have developed. Uh, we shared it last week so you could see um, there's a whole host of information on this site. Um, you can, just moving my screen over, you can find different information about the climate crisis, uh, nomad resettlement, water issues. There are videos, there's information about our talks. Um, I really wanted to show the take action page. Um, there are some actions that are being done as part of the climate strikes. Um, Tibet groups are urging people to take as much action as possible specifically on Tibet the Tibet climate crisis linked to the Friday climate strikes, um, obviously at home at the moment, but when they come back out onto the streets also to be joining. Um, I really wanted to um, show you that there are a number of petitions. So there's one about Tibet nomads, which is urging the Human Rights Commissioner to ensure that when she goes on a visit to China, she goes to Tibet but not just goes to Tibet, she goes and visits Tibetan nomad um, areas and meets with Tibetan nomads and talks about the resettlement program. Um, there's one on damming and there is one on um, the environment, the Tibetan environment activist, um, Anya Sengdra, who was raised by both 
um, Keensum and Lobsang. Uh, Anis Sengdra is a Tibetan nomad. He worked really, really hard in his community on a number of issues. He worked um, to raise the issue of um, uh, uh, the uh, what's happening with mining in the areas that he lives in um, and he did a huge amount about anti-corruption and anti-corruption specifically linked to um, how Tibetan nomads who had been resettled were not getting the provisions that they need that they needed. Um, he was sentenced to seven years in prison for this uh, human rights defender work that he was carrying out um, and he is appealing against that sentence and we just found out yesterday that his appeal will take place um, on Monday, Monday the 27th of April. Uh, Tibet groups around the world are doing work now to, to highlight his case with governments to make sure that China know that we are watching when this appeal takes place and we are urging that they do not resentence him and that he is released because he's entirely innocent. Uh, I urge you to go to the Take Action page and to sign the petition um, for his release so that we can really, really uh, ramp up that, you know, we are watching and we know this is happening. Um, so please do 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 that. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to show you, um, there are Tibet groups around the world working on not just uh, Tibetan freedom uh, work, um, though this is, as, as we've said, this is all linked together, but there are groups that are doing a huge amount of work on Tibet's environment. Um, and on the Who We Are page of the Tibet Climate Crisis.org site, um, you can scroll down and see a whole list of different groups that are that are doing specific environment work. Um, so, for instance, here is Visit um, Australia Tibet Council, the organisation that Keenzon works for. Um, you can go there, click on the button, and you can find out exactly what your local Tibet um, organisation is doing, and you can join them, and you can take take actions um, with with them directly. So we do urge you also to do that. Um, and that's it. Thank you so much to everyone for joining. A huge thank you again to Lobsang, Kingsham and Simon for joining us. Um, it was a great discussion and I hope that you come back and talk to us again at another time. Thank you. Thank, you, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you everyone. Bye.